And we're back with Record Live, our first broadcast for 2023. Um, it's great to see you again, Zanita, and it's really nice that you're in the office this week um, mm. with us at Adventist Media because for those that don't know, Zanita usually works remotely. So welcome, Zanita. Thank you. Um, we've also got a special guest today. We thought we'd kick the year off. Um, you probably don't want to hear from just Zanita and myself. We thought we'd get a special guest to give us all the um, info that we need today. And that special guest is Paul Borgus. Paul, you are the course convener or the course coordinator at Avondale University for the counselling um, streams, the counselling subjects and courses there. And you've got a background in family um, and marriage therapy um, counselling. Um, so you've got some experience in relationships, which is our topic for today. And it's really great to have you with us. It's a, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much, Jared. Now, Paul, um, we have a bit of a theme going on with relationships at the moment. Obviously, yesterday was Valentine's Day. Um, this week is Marriage and Family Week. And the issue that we're currently working on in the Office for Science is also a relationship focus kind of piece. And so we thought just starting off um, today's conversation, maybe you could share with us the best piece of relationship advice that you've ever received. I think don't forget Valentine's Day, I think. Um, I want you to know, Zanita, a red rose did appear on the pillow of my wife's side of the bed last night. Nice. And she came home about 4 o'clock. She's a school teacher, and she didn't go up to the bedroom until it was time to go to bed. So I keep thinking, have you actually seen? You know, there was a little bear and the card and, you know, um, so she got a lovely surprise about 10 o'clock when she finally went up to, to the bedroom. But I, I think for me, Zanita, some of the best advice that I've had comes from a guy called John Gottman, who's written numerous books in the area of relationships based on 35, I think 40 years of research, seen as one of the best voices out there and one of the best researchers on what actually makes marriages work long term. And I think there are a couple of things from him that I've really found incredibly helpful. The first is that you don't have to solve all your problems in relationships. In fact, he found that people who had long-lasting marriages and were happy there, so we're not just talking about people who are enduring their marriage, but people who are enjoying their marriage, we, he found that 70% of the problems they had were never solved. He called them perpetual problems. These are things to do with idiosync uh, idiosyncratic behaviours. These are to do with personality traits. These are to do with likes and dislikes. And, and that means that we are always going to come up against that stuff. I, I, I get a little bit amused when people say, you know, I've been married for 40 years and we've never had an argument. Um, my initial... My initial temptation is to go, well, dementia's got you already. Um, or, <laughs> or, you know, the good outweighs the bad so much that you can't even remember the arguments you had. The other option is to say, well, maybe you don't talk at all because if you don't talk, you can't argue. Um, <laughs> the, the idea that people in good marriages actually don't solve most of their problems, but they find a way of dealing with them that doesn't take away from the essential good stuff in their relationship. In other words, they manage their perpetual problems. They don't necessarily solve them. Mm -hmm. A lot of them can't be solved. Yeah. Um, Just before you go to your second your second point there, Paul, 70% surprises me. That's high. Mm -hmm. it's, it's higher than I would have expected when you started talking about these perpetual problems. Maybe there's hope. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so Gottman says, Jared, that 30%, about 30% he, he calls uh, solvable problems and that about 70% he said are about managing. In other words, how do we manage our conversations around that? How, we, how do we decide what hills are worth dying on? What things we can mm -hmm. just let go even though they bug us? Um, you know, those, th those kinds of things. Um, in order to further my education in marriage and family therapy, it is possible that sometimes I'm at, I watch Married at First Sight with my wife, you know, because then we can sit there and kind of criticise everyone else's relationship. And, <laughs> right? 
of, of projecting your own stuff onto the screen. But um, if any of you, and I'm sure you aren't, but if any of you are watching maths at the moment, um, Married at First Sight, there is a guy on there, a uh, fairly uh, interesting character. And of course, you know, shows like that, reality shows, really love people that are that, are that out there and he's very out there. Um, but he has all of these, what he called icks, and all of these things that he listed down that a partner mustn't have. And there was a long list of them. And these are all the things that gives him an icky feeling. And both my wife and I said to each other, yeah, and then you have to go on the reality TV show to try to get a partner because you've chased so many away. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. we, we have to kind of decide that even if something irks us a little bit, what do we need to do to let that go? And why does that irk us? And, yeah, what, why is it such a big deal? And there are a lot of things that may feel like they're a big deal, but when you boil that down, is it really? Yeah, is it really? What's the worst thing that could happen if our partner never changes? And in reality, partners don't change all that much. They change a bit with behaviour, but personality characteristics, they're biologically wired to a large extent or, you know, formed and shaped by early life experiences. I was going to give you a second one, wasn't I? I was gonna, I'll, I'll make yeah, this one a lot. Before you do the second one, can I ask you about the first one? <laughs> Um, you mentioned that we can work through a lot of these things, but as I was asking some people in the office before this conversation, uh, what are some things they would like to know? They were actually asking, like, well, how do we actually have these difficult conversations? Like, what are some tools to have those? Because maybe we can work through them, but we still kind of need to know how. Yeah, yeah. I think the worst thing to do is to try to work through it when you are what psychologists call flooded. In other words, you know, you've gone into fight and flight response. Fight, mm -hmm. flight or freeze. Freeze is that stonewalling thing that people do in relations when they just refuse to talk. Um, yeah. Fight is pretty obvious. You fire back. Flight is you just walk out of the room, you're gone or dissociate or whatever. Um, that's the worst time to try to solve things. We, we often say, particularly in Christian circles, never go to bed angry. I'm not sure that's a great idea at all because at one in the morning when you are still trying to sort something out and you're more and more tired and you're more and more in defence mode, you've got Buckley's chance of sorting that out. You're probably far better to take time out to go, let's just put this on hold, let's get back to this at a time when you know, we are both actually in, in a state. So I think timing is really important for any kind of conflict resolution or problem talk um i've suggested to some of my couples that they have a weekly or fortnightly state of the union talk yeah. where there's specific rules there's a structure around that and you know you give each other some affirmations because we know affirmations are a great way to start any conversation to tell the person what they are doing well before you tell them what they're not doing well uh, and the less defensiveness if that happens. And this is a, a place where you, know, you use all those good communication skills, I statements rather than you statements, get the blame out of it, you know, have a problem, uh, a, a kind of a solution-focused emphasis to the conversation. It doesn't matter who broke it. I mean, couples, couples spend a lot of time paying counsellors like myself to talk about who broke it. And you can't, who cares who broke it? What, what does it matter? You know, who broke it? It's broken. How do we put it back together? That's what really matters. Um, but see, this comes from a view of causality, which we call the linear view of causality. A causes B, in other words. She did that, therefore, our marriage is no good. And it's always more complicated than that. We believe in the circular view of causality. Somebody does one thing which affects what the other person does, which affects what the first person does, and it just goes around. And in that kind of a model, it's really hard to figure out and particularly unhelpful to say who caused what. Now, there are some extreme examples where it's pretty easy, such as an extramarital affair or alcoholism or something like that, but they're extreme. Yeah, um, that's not the... You know, the run-of-the-mill stuff that comes to couples' counsel is usually on, on yeah, nowhere near as obvious um, as as that. It seems and, like almost hu human nature, Paul, to um, try and have a narrative or trying to understand the story, why someone did something. And so that A to B seems to make more sense to us perhaps than the sort of circular causality that you're reflecting on and 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 
just for me, I guess, just listening to what you've just just answered in that question, it's it's a helpful paradigm shift to go, well, actually, it's a lot more complicated. There's a lot more factors bearing down that perhaps I'm not even thinking of because I'm always thinking what's happening to me, what what what's the problem here and and making a story up in my head. Sometimes we all do it to yeah. to explain why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling. And, and you're saying that's not always helpful because we can actually blame where it's not due or we don't we don't aim, as you said, to fix the broken thing. We just want to apportion blame to someone who's who's done that. I think that's a really helpful, yeah, you've 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 given me something to think about, <laughs> which is good. I, I, I think the the issue is, Jared, that you know, I can come up with a narrative in my head, but invariably it'll be different to the narrative that my wife has. And I think one of the really helpful things that I've learned is that there are going to be all, a number of narratives about any incident that happened. You know, my wife's going to have her version of what happened you know, when we argued at that particular point in time. I'm going to have my version of it. And... Um, Maybe I just need to keep mine to myself. You know, maybe that's the most helpful because if I am trying to force mine on her, she's going to get defensive. She's going to fire back and fight for her territory. And then we get into a power struggle. And one of the things that I have found helpful, maybe this can be the second thing. Um, I've just replaced the one I was going to say. Um, uh, the second thing is to actually, and this can be really, really um, quite challenging, but one of the things I've challenged myself to do is if there's a discussion, you know, my wife and I don't argue, we just have robust discussions. Um, uh, yeah, if in one of these robust discussions, yeah, I, I stop long enough to ask myself the question, what is more important right now for me to win or to solve the issue and move on? What's more important? And if I'm honest with myself, I have to come to the horrifying realisation that so often I want to win. That's what I really want to do. I just, darn it, I just want to win. And as soon as I identify that motive win in myself, then I can go, okay, I need to back off because this is now about my ego and that's not going to, that's not going to be helpful. That's not going to, yeah, if I need to win this, all I'm doing is empowering the other person who will then also want to win because nobody likes to lose. Yeah, so... I think it's your turn now. I'll yeah. enough. Sorry, my mouse was stuck. Um, wouldn't unmute me. Um, so when we're having some of these um, intense moments of fellowship, I call them in in my marriage, <laughs> we 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 can get quite heated. We and I think the advice to step away and try and try and plan a time to resolve it is is very helpful. Um, what are some things that can make our relationships more resilient? So things that bother us, we can live with that because we've we've put things in place that just make it longer lasting, that just makes us survive some of those conflicts, those little battles, and, and, and we get out of them winning, both winning on the same side. How, how can we make ourselves more resilient in those relationships? I think one of the most important things is, is to do what... Gottman says, and to build a relationship that has what he terms as positive sentiment override. Now, that's a technical term. It simply means you put deposits in the bank because mm -hmm. you, you will probably both know and can relate to this that there are some times when something that your partner does is just not an issue. You just go, ah, whatever, they've just had a hard day, and you go and give them a hug, and, yeah, it's all good. And there are other times that that starts, yeah. A real conflict and a real battle and I think it has a lot to do with w how much goodwill there is in the relationship at any particular point of time when there's a lot of goodwill and that's what we mean by positive sentiment override when there's a lot of goodwill we can let things go we can let them slide we go oh, it's not a biggie you know our partner speaks to us a bit of impatient voice or tells us off about something and we just go I don't need to do anything with that I know they're going through a rough time at the moment or and it's cool. I don't need to even take it personally, you know, because we're good. We're in a good place. She's just, you know, she's just a bit crabby. That's fine, yeah. And and we don't have to do anything with it because the problem is when people get in an attack defence pattern, 
with escalation. In other words, one person says something, the other person fires back, the other person says something, and it's a downward spiral um, that uh, then escalates to the point where people say really, really damaging things. And I have told couples there's some things that should just never be said, even if you think them. One of those would be, I wish I hadn't married you. I've known couples who've said that. Try to back from that. That's a big one. If you think it, that's normal. Most people sometime in their marriage will go, what was I thinking? You know, what on earth did I do? You know, this is so hard. That's, that's not unusual that that's going to happen sometime in a long-term marriage. But not everything you think at any particular moment of time necessarily has to be expressed because once you express it, then it becomes your partner's problem rather than your problem to deal with. It then becomes your partner's problem and then it becomes a relationship issue. And mm. so, yeah, any type of put downs or name calling or, you know, as a couples counsellor, you know, who's been doing this for many years, I have heard of some horrible things that people who supposedly love each other and people who supposedly follow Jesus as well have said to their partner, just horrific stuff that should never, ever be said, language that should not be used, you know, terms, insulting terms, derogatory terms that should just never be said, put downs. Yeah, you know, those, those things are incredibly damaging and sometimes make it hard to come back from that. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because... Some people, I guess, take relationships as, oh, you should be 100% honest with your partner. Tell them everything you're thinking. But um, I guess you're saying there should be boundaries even with that. <laughs> totally. I get really nervous Anita, when people say that. We tell each other everything and I go, oh, horrors. You know, really? Does she want to know every time you look inappropriately at somebody on the beach? Does she really want to know that? That's your problem. That's your problem of lust and how you deal with that, you know? Um yeah, you've got to deal with that um, to keep your thoughts pure. And, 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 and you yeah, know, that's your own personal problem. It's not your partner's problem. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't think honesty is the same as telling a person absolutely everything. I think they're two different things. Because yeah. some thoughts, like the thought, I wish I hadn't married you, may be gone in half an hour. And you go, oh, yeah, I'm really glad I did. And you say you have that internal dialogue with yourself. It's a moment of anger. I remember very well, Sanita, when um, I sat with this couple, this was years ago, and she kept session after session, she kept coming back to a fight they'd had two years previously where he had, in the middle of it, said, I wish I hadn't married you. He had apologised a thousand times. He had said he was angry. He didn't mean he'd said all that. And all that was stuck in her mind was, you said it. You said it. You, you wish you hadn't married. You don't want to actually be here. And he protested and she said, you said it. She was stuck on that. She couldn't move beyond that. She couldn't see that as, yeah, something unfortunate that he had said because it had hurt her so deeply. Hmm. I guess it leans into another point uh, that I was thinking about is um, I think sometimes these days we expect our partner to be everything. So, for example, I have a partner and I expect him to be my partner and my girlfriends and my mum and my dad. Like, we go to our partners for all things and it's kind of the same as, like, we don't have to share everything with our partner. Like, we also have our friends. Do you kind of see that in a lot of relationships these days? Or um... I, I, think, I think when relationships start off, they often are seen by the young couple as, well, you're everything. You know, I'm now complete. This idea that I wasn't complete before, but now I am, you know, I've got my better half. Now I'm a better person. None of that is sound. I don't think it's sound biblically. It's certainly not sound psychologically. The idea that you can't be a whole person unless you're in an intimate relationship. Where did that come from? You know, pity for the apostles, pity for Jesus. Yeah, he wasn't married, so was he not a whole person? Yeah, you you get to you get to a pretty ridiculous place if if you if you if you see it that way. Um I I remember somebody saying to me some years ago, um, she said, I decided a long time ago that my husband was never going to get what emotions are about, that he was never going to get it, and I needed to give up trying to tell him about my feelings and just hang out with my girlfriends when I need to have chat about feelings. My husband's a wonderful man. She said, I love him, and, you know, I don't want to be without him, and we have a lot of fun, and we have a good marriage, and I talk when I want to talk 
emotionally, I go to my girlfriends because they get it. He'll never get it. And she said, I, I've stopped blaming him for that. It's never going to change. He, he doesn't want to know about it. He doesn't know how to spell the word feeling. So, you know, um, I'm, I, I go to my girlfriends and I get other needs met. And I think that shows the maturity of a relationship. When you go, these are the needs that are met in my relationship and this is the stuff that, yeah, I, I do elsewhere and I don't need to necessarily do that with my partner. And I think that comes to activities. I ride a bike. My wife's never going to go cycling with me at six in the morning, you know, <laughs> dressed in lycra. That's never going to happen, you know. <laughs> she thinks I'm insane getting up at that time to ride a road bike, you know, on the road with trucks and cars. Like, she thinks I'm, I'm crazy, you know. Uh, you know. I need a psychiatric evaluation. So, yeah, it's never going to be what, what, what she does. And it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. That's good. I, and I think that's actually very liberating um, in terms of I, I feel like unmet expectations are often something in a relationship that can really damage and, and, and be difficult um, for it. But oftentimes it's just, yeah, you're expecting that significant other to be a counsellor, a protector, a provider, a husband, a friend, they're everything. And and, and this brings us to um, something. Zanita wrote a, a piece for the Signs of the Times magazine, and it's, it's looking at the, um, it's actually about the recession of sex, the great sex recession, they're calling it. People aren't hooking up or connecting with others as frequently, including young people. Um, but I guess the the place we landed on with that piece was that it seems like society is more and more disconnected. We're not having significant relationships. We're having trouble making friends. Um, we had an office conversation about how hard it is. Uh, people joke about Jesus's greatest miracle being having 12 close friends in his thirties. So, you know, people are feeling that loneliness epidemic, that disconnect. Um, how can we get better at that? How can we get better at diversifying, I guess, our relationships and not expecting one person to be the be all and end all? Are yeah. there things we can put in place to actually invest in other significant relationships than our intimate, intimate partner relationship? Yeah. Just to reinforce what you're saying, Jared, one of the questions I will often use in therapy, both in couples therapy and individual therapy, is to ask about how many good friends the person has. And it's quite scary, the amount of people who says, well, no one I'm close to, uh, you know, um, or nobody that I could ring if I was in trouble. I have three or four acquaintances and I talk to them occasionally, you know, I get along well with the people at work, but nobody that I would share with you, with, you know, uh, share with what I've just told you. It's really scary that people will come to a stranger who they pay to see to tell them about the stuff that is most painful or most relevant in their life, but don't have people around them that they can trust with that information. I think that's I, I think that's really unfortunate. It's a, it's amazing how often that gets said to me. Uh, what do you do about that? I th I think. I think you have to start taking risks. And this is what I encourage my clients to do. Take a little risk. Start, you know, invite somebody to that you know that you seem to get along well with. Say, you know, can we go out to a cafe and sit down and, you know, have a, have a, 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 a drink together? Can, can we, you know, I, I enjoy just, you know, uh, going and, and, and having lunch with you. Um and, and doing that and, and then building something upon which we can then have a deeper and more meaningful conversation. I, I think you have to start slow because if people try to go, okay, I'm going to have this deeper, meaningful conversation about my depression with somebody I work with, it's either going to freak the other person out or it's going to freak them out. So I think you have to, you have to establish a context. And this is where community, including church, yeah, is so, so important. I think one of the one of the struggles with church is is we do this pretend thing at church, don't we? You know, um, I, I mean, you will know when when you go to church on a, on a Saturday morning, um, and somebody asks, "How are you, Jared? What do you say, Jared?" 
pretty good at the moment. I've got a newborn in the house, so I say a bit sleep deprived, <laughs> but generally it's, yeah, I'm good, thanks. How are you? <laughs> and in saying that you're a bit sleep deprived, you've probably gone further and made yourself a little more vulnerable. Not a lot of people do. Um, I remember very well a public announcement being made at the church that I went to that somebody in leadership that he and his wife uh, had separated. They were both in leadership and somebody said, just for you to know that this is what's happened. So next week, she's not there, but he is. He comes to church and I say to him, so how are you? And without blinking, he said, fine, I'm good. <laughs> and I just looked at him and I said, I'm not buying that. He said, well, what, what do you mean? Yeah, I was like, well, why would you not believe me that I'm good? I said, with what we heard in church last week, I cannot understand that you could be okay. And it really took him back and he stopped, didn't say anything. He was a man of many words, so this was something for him not to speak. He didn't say anything for a little while and then he looked at me and he said, I'm as good as can be expected under the circumstances. Can you accept that? And I said, yeah, I'll buy that. I said, that sounds a bit honest, you know. And we would, uh, over the weeks, I would say, so how are you? He said, you're not going to accept fine, are you? And I said, no, I'm not going to accept that. I said, I value you too much to accept fine. And, and we started to get just that little bit deeper. And I think communities often struggle to do that. So we live in cliche land. Rather, it's not about saying everything, but it is at least about saying something. And we may want to say, yeah, it's a tough week, but yeah. Um, and, and, and the person then has the option of going, do you need to talk about it? And I might say, no, nah, not really, but thanks. Yeah. Or actually, I wouldn't mind. Can we catch up this week? Yeah. Um, yeah. I just don't think we foster emotional intelligence in many community settings. And, and you know, the one I'm probably most familiar with is church. You know, and I don't think, I think we could do that a lot better. Hmm. I guess on that topic, um I'm all for having these open how are you questions. Uh, but I think what a lot of people fear is they fear being vulnerable, but they also don't know who to trust and how to trust people. Like, I don't know, from my experience, like when I haven't been doing well and people have asked me that general, like, how are you? Some people I feel okay talking to and then some people I'm like, I don't really want to bear my sleeve to you kind of thing. Um, how do we know, like, I guess, how to trust people or who to trust and what are some ways that we can build that if we just aren't open to anyone? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think we actually have to ask ourselves, what is the chance that this person will not gossip about the information that I've told them? And if we go, the chance is pretty small that they won't gossip, then it's not safe to share. And then we may have to come out with a cliche because it's just not safe. And if we do, we're going to regret it. So I, I think it's about asking ourselves probably two questions. One, can this person just accept the emotion that I want to share with them? Do, you know, do I have some confidence that they'll accept it, not preach at me, not give me a Bible text, not write me off with a cliche or anything like that because then I'm going to feel that my emotion isn't taken seriously? And secondly, can they keep this to themselves? And in the church, we don't do confidentiality really that well, I think. In a lot of communities, we don't. And, and it's, it's a pity in the church because if somebody says something to us, we just assume that that's, you know, common knowledge. Um, and, uh, you know, a person may have trusted us with a personal story. And if it's something personal, the safest thing we can do is just keep it to ourselves. And, and I think if, if we fostered that more in communities and churches, that would show real respect to other people's painful experiences, thus making it safer for people to share some of that you know, in those communities. We're fast running out of time, Paul. We want to respect your time as well. Um, but a question that's burning in this conversation around relationships for me is, how do we know? And, 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 and I think Christians have particular trouble with this, right? Jesus taught us to forgive. He taught us to forgive, you know, 70 times 7, 490 times. You can't count it. Just forgive. And one thing I think as Christians we have trouble with is knowing when to end a relationship. Some relationships end, whether it's friends, family members, there's something toxic, there's abuse situations, even intimate, you know, um, marriages 
we don't like to talk about the end of marriages because you know there's certain texts about divorce that we 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 may take out of context or or we think others will judge us for um mm. when is when is how do we know if we're in a relationship that's not you know maybe it's on shaky ground and we go no i'm going to stick this out i'm going to be resilient i'm going to practice the 70% rule that you put in place earlier or actually there's red flags this relationship for my own benefit needs to end for that person's benefit um it's toxic or it's it's not working um i have to end this friendship i have to go to a different church i have to stop seeing these friends from this period in my life because they're not healthy for me in this period of my life um whatever the relationship is is there anything we can do to to help us answer that question if we're in a season like that hmm yeah i think there are some things joe and it's an excellent question the the first thing i'd want to say is forgiveness and having relationship are not one and the same thing i think forgiveness is always a good aim but we have to realize firstly that forgiveness is a process and sometimes it can take years if something really really horrible has happened to us um but that does not mean we should have re you know that we should initiate or reconcile necessarily with the person because forgiveness is about letting go the anger the need for vengeance the the need to get even all of that letting that go and that's important for me to be able to do that but it may never be safe for me to be in that person's company again that just maybe just the reality of it i think some warning signs in whether it's an intimate relationship or whether it's a friendship relationship or even a work environment is for us to monitor our own anxiety you know how anxious do we get when we know we're going to be around this person does our anxiety just go off the scale no matter what we do no matter what we try to do we just cannot yeah get past this massive anxiety that we have that is only relieved once we know that encounter is over that's a warning sign if that continues if that goes on for a long period of time you know months or even years you go yeah what is it there i think also the question i would ask is do we feel some kind of safety with this person do we feel safe yeah you know, or do we feel that they could attack us they could say something be sarcastic uh and have a go at our character and it's not just a one off thing it's not just something they did accidentally but it's a continual pattern of that so i make a difference between a one off instance something that can happen we can all say stupid things versus a pattern um i think also we need to listen to the advice of others sometimes i find that people stay in relationships or foster relationships with everybody around them can see how destructive it actually is and i've had people come and say to me she is a different person since she's been with him her whole character has changed we don't even know who she is anymore and i'm i'm a believer particularly when it comes to marriage i'm a believer in marriage and i have a very high view of marriage both as a christian and as a marriage and family therapist i no longer believe in marriage at all costs no i don't think the bible does and i'm pretty sure god doesn't in fact i'm 100% sure god is is not expecting us to stay somewhere where for example we are being physically and emotionally abused and when someone's being physically abused they're usually being emotionally abused um even large levels of emotional abuse can hurt every bit as much as physical abuse and i i don't think it's a contradiction of a high view of marriage to say there needs to be situations that are downright dangerous and we need to get out of there there are times like that um where the person has shown no signs of any lasting change yes they may say sorry when it happens but it happens all over again uh, yeah a week later or two weeks or a month later i mean the typical cycle of domestic violence for example comes to mind um unless we have some reason to believe that change is actually occurring we need to ask ourselves some very honest questions which is at what cost am i prepared to continue this relationship and, and, and it's one of the common questions i'll ask clients what are you prepared to pay in order to stay in this relationship and and are you okay with what you're paying to be in this relationship whether it's a friendship mm. or a relationship 
Mm, so good. I um, I guess to land the plane, it would be nice to end on a lighter note. And and yeah, yesterday, was obviously, was Valentine's Day. <laughs> yesterday was Valentine's Day, which was, <clears throat> sorry, a good kick for people to kind of do something exciting with their partner. Um, and I suppose just to end it on a practical note, like what are some fun things we can do, whether it's like with a partner or a friend? Because I remember when I was in school, we had someone from sex ed come in and give us a sheet of like things we could do with our, with our partner instead of having sex. And it was like feed the ducks, go visit someone in a retirement home. And I was like, I don't even want to do this now, let alone with a partner <laughs> down the track. Like, and so do you have any just fun, practical ideas of like, dates we can go on or things we can do with our loved ones. Dax doesn't cut it, okay. Feeling <laughs> <laughs> the temptation away. <laughs> I think yeah. that's a different one, Zanita, because everybody is different and what different people enjoy. I think I think you've been in a relationship uh, for a while. It's think back at the stuff you used to enjoy. I mean, a lot of couples I talk to don't do the stuff anymore that they did lots of when they first got married or lots of when they started dating, and they just don't do it anymore. Why? Because they're busy, because they're counting pennies, because you know they haven't prioritized, they haven't been intentional about it. I, I think intentionality is important to actually get the diary out and go, okay, we are going away this weekend. Yeah, just the two of us. We are going away. Um, and that's hard when you've got kids and, and, you know, that may not be appropriate when when kids are really little. But um, to, to be as intentional as you possibly can about time together and try to remember what did we do before that was fun. Um, second bit of advice I'd have um, which is should be self-evident, but yeah, Jill and I will go out to a restaurant and we'll look around and we'll see these couples sitting there and guess what they're both doing? They're both on their phones. Yeah, we look there and we go, there's a really nice restaurant, but what they're doing is exactly what they could do at home without paying $150 to $200 for this lovely meal in this really good restaurant because they're just on their phones and you just, and it's not just young people, you know, there's people my age, you just sit there on the phone. We become addicted to the jolly things. And I, I think that's that's a real danger. There's some, um, just to, to end with one more comment from Gottman, if I may, he has this lovely term where he talks about love maps. And he says, people in long-term relationships, you know, people who've, who stay together, and he did longitudinal studies, followed couples for 20 years. And he found that what they did was they created a love map about their partner. And what that means is they knew lots of little things, seemingly insignificant things, but all those things together showed their partner that they really were interested in their life. And so Gottman actually has a, an app um, and it's called Gottman Love Maps, $2.99. Um, and sometimes Dylan and I will sit at a restaurant and I'll pull this thing out and I'll ask some questions from it. Then you pass the phone backwards and forwards. And the Pretty simple things, best movie you ever saw, worst movie you ever saw, most painful experience you've ever had, closest friend, yeah, um, all of those things. People can be together for years and not know that sort of stuff about each other. Um, does that answer your question, Salita? Yeah. Is that better than being <laughs> done? Yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's very cool. So the just as we finish... Paul, the Seventh Day Adventist Church is um, uh, recognizing, honoring um, Christian Home and Marriages Week at this week. Um, if you're listening to this live, um, they've got a website with a bunch of resources. Um, they're looking. I've shared the link in the comments here. They're looking at um, particularly mental health of the family. I know that's a very important subject that we haven't had time to touch on today. Maybe we can get you back in at some point to to talk about some of that. But um, yeah, there's some resources that they've developed and there's other places that you can get help. Um, you know, we, we um, obviously Paul's been good enough to join us today, but there is therapy and counselling available for people that are really struggling with different relationships and things in life. And and about that, that, Jared, that some people think you only go to marital counselling when your marriage is on life support. I would suggest go yes. well or the marriage has to be admitted into ICU. Yeah, um, yeah. See, see marriage counselling as preventative. You know, there may be just some little things that you're just stuck on. You seem to keep having the same conversations that are not satisfactory. 
sometimes three or four sessions of couples therapy will be enough to get you unstuck having an objective outside third party just taking you through a process there have been numerous couples over the years where i've gone i wish they had come years earlier because by now they've done so much damage that we may mm. i don't know you know it might be too late um and i would advise people don't wait till it gets really really bad yeah as soon as you get stuck yeah. it's the time to go let's get a little professional help that's that's great advice because uh, yeah a pastor that um uh we know told us or would explain it this way you know you get your car serviced every year every six months maybe for three four hundred dollars you might spend with upgrading it looking after it getting new parts so that it runs smoothly so that it doesn't just fall apart one day you know and and that's what i hear you saying about our marriages and that's what he the point he made spend it was for a couples conference that they used to hold every year they spend 300 bucks come away with your your missus have a good weekend invest in your marriage it's a maintenance thing it's keeping the car running keep the engine running don't wait until it completely conks out and you've got to wait for four hours in the rain for the nrma or <laughs> whoever's the roadside assistant so i think i think that's a really good thing to leave us with um to think about hey let's invest in our relationships and our marriages before they reach breaking point awesome well, thank you again, Paul, for joining us. It's been awesome to pick from your knowledge. Mm. Um, as for everyone else, we will be back next Wednesday for another episode of Record Live. So tune in. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.